this is just going to be a very casual conversation between two of our subject matter experts that we have today. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Mike Watson. He is the VP of Engineering Hi. at Zinnerzip. So Mike, why don't you give us a start on what we're going to be talking about today? Sure. Thanks, Jill. Um, as Jill said, I'm Mike Watson, VP of Engineering at Zinnerzip. I've been with Zinnerzip for a couple of years now and uh, had an opportunity to work with several clients and um, you know, see how the how it works. Uh, I was a former client of Synerzip. Uh, you'll even you even can find my uh, testimonial on the web page. Uh, on with me on this panel is Makund Rajmanar. And uh, Makund, will you introduce yourself? Hey, hey everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Mukund. I've been with uh, Synerzip for more little more than a decade, and I've been uh, practicing agile. Uh, software delivery ever since I joined Sunazip. So I'm happy to talk to Mike about the subject which we, which is close to us on a daily basis. Yeah, thanks. Hey Mike, do you want to get started with a quick poll? Yeah, let's do that, Jill. That sounds great. Um, so if you look in your polls, um, I'm asking, do you currently have a way to assess your agile pro processes? Let me get it started. There we go. I think I'm showing the wrong screen now. <laughs> I see the poll. Uh, yeah, so while everyone's taking the poll, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the checklist, how it came about, uh, what we use it for in Synerzip. So the Agile checklist is a way for us to assess how we're doing in any one of our projects. Uh, we we uh, have a formal review process where we go through with the team members and ask them some questions and fill out the checklist uh, to help us get a better picture of where we're at and where we need to go um, by um, seeing the risks that might be out there. So Jill, do you have some results from that poll? Yes, we do. All right, so. About 40% say yes, and we have a big percent that says, huh? Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so, uh, Let's let's dive into it a little bit more. So, um, Jill, if you don't mind bringing up the, you want to see the checklist? Self for a second. Um, you have the ability to download it, as Jill said, and you can follow along there. It's um, you know in a single page. It's actually you know pretty pretty uh, much an eye chart. So, uh, so the first thing we noticed when we started building this is that. Um, we started with the agile practices, realizing that these practices are important. Some of them, sometimes we call those ceremonies or whatever. Uh, and what we realized though, is the practices, although interesting, what we what we saw is there's a relationship to those practices and people owning those practices and thus, you know, having this role structure. And what we found, uh, and maybe McCoon can expand on this, is that um, frequently we found when there was missing roles, there was problems. McCoon, can you give us an example of that? Yeah, I mean, um, so in any project, uh, people end up play, doing playing multiple roles, but the, they don't identify the role itself. And what we found in many cases is that uh, if a role is not specifically identified and addressed, uh, it doesn't work well. So. On uh, the most common example uh, would be that of, for example, of a product uh, uh, manager, uh, where we uh, the product manager. You can hear me very well, right? Yeah, where uh, the product manager uh, is is responsible for uh, taking stuff to market and making sure that uh, the monetization and the uh, user engagement, uh, all these things happen as per the vision of the product, right? So. When we, form, when we form a team to build a product, uh, many times are we really defining uh, these roles uh, consciously and making sure that things happen uh, to the role. So that's something which uh, we found that number of our clients didn't do uh, when we engage with them. And then we talked them through it and uh, it has produced some pretty good results uh, when, uh, you know, uh, when they realize that, oh, you know, that's something which needs more focus. Got it. So having a strong product manager that can communicate effectively 
uh, is, is critical in your mind. Is that what you're saying? So Jill, with that, yeah. let's let's do another poll um, and see what people might find are missing in their uh, agile teams. What roles uh, might be getting away from them? So, so McCoon, can you give us a, an example of uh, maybe a project you've worked on and specifically how you saw that it wasn't working out well, but it improved when this happened? Some specific example would be helpful. Um, for specific example, let's take uh, uh, the role of, uh, so we had a client, let's talk about product manager since I spoke Yeah, let's, let's stay on that topic, that's perfect. Yeah, so we had a client in uh, clinical trial financial management systems, CTFMS, right? Uh, where the client was a startup and then the client the, 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 was a visionary who knew what he wanted to build. Uh, he had the domain expertise, he knew what he wanted. Uh, but then articulating that and having a go-to-market, uh, well, he was doing it alone, right? So we spoke to him and then said, you know what, let's engage a product, uh, let's bring in a product manager into the team, doesn't matter from where. Once you bring a product manager to the team, uh, the product manager was then able to pick up the domain knowledge, um, then come up in, and the technology which was going to be used. And then the founder was uh, able to sync up with the product manager and uh, augment the go-to-market strategy, right? So this helped uh, the client actually build uh, a product from ground zero. And we have quickly deployed uh, the solution in two clinical studies in geographically remote areas, right? So the things like, you know, competitive analysis, market trends, advancement in clinical trials, uh, and all of these, how they tune the product strategy for a successful go-to-market, uh, these things were done by the uh, product manager. Uh, in the team, and that was quite uh, successful. What are the rules? Okay. Yeah, got it. Yeah, um, My, that's, that's helpful. So, Jill, you have uh, results from the second poll. Sorry, I was. Yeah, muted. I see the results. It says, "What are the roles?" Right. Yeah, a lot of people are wondering what the roles are. Got it. Um, yeah, so let's talk through uh, those roles in a little bit of detail. Um, can you go back to the chart? There you go. So you can see on the columns on the top, the, the roles we've identified as critical, um, and maybe this is a complete list um, for most teams, is obviously dev and QA. They're, they're the backbone of making uh, products, but also we have the product owner, um, a dev manager, scrum master, um, UI, UX, and DevOps. Um, DevOps being the most interesting one to me because this is kind of a new concept of embedding embedding someone who is responsible for, um, you know, the tooling, security, and also you know, IT infrastructure like networking, embedding them directly into the teams. That's fairly new in the agile world. Um, and something that we found is very helpful uh, in projects especially if you can get DevOps started early to get the pipelines in place and everything moving forward. Um, what do you think about that, Makun? Yeah, it's uh, many people have a direct cloud native strategy, right? They launch their products directly on the cloud provider. And uh, pretty much everyone in software development is aware of uh, all the services cloud providers do. Uh, but there needs to be constant focus on uh, what's new, what's coming out, how to optimize your cost, which services to use, and how to securely deploy your product in production, how to secure your source code. And everyone likes open source. How do you make sure that the right version of open source tools are used? Uh, if there is a, you know, if there is a high priority security fix uh, in our dependency, do we make sure that that comes into the project? Uh, so the focus needs to be there for somebody uh, to look at the entire aspect of uh, production deployment, production monitoring, do we have all, everything in there? Uh, and also make sure that the product which, which is being built is uh, stable and all that. Uh, if we club that along with the developer role, the developer's role is to build functionality uh, based on an architecture for a given specification. And uh, the developer hat is different from somebody who's just focused on making sure things run well. And since uh, we are moving to cloud native approach these days, uh, 
and cloud service providers keep churning out new features every few months, uh, it's really important for somebody to have that focus. So we find that DevOps uh, does help. Uh, we have had examples where uh, we managed to cut down costs for a customer who was in uh, video streaming analytics. Uh, when we added a dedicated DevOps person with the you know the detailed knowledge of what it meant to run stuff at scale, uh, the costing came down uh, by about uh, 30 percent, uh, which was a huge saving. So DevOps is something which we find more and more in software development these days. Now, that's a role which people really the, we need to focus on. Doesn't matter who does it, somebody needs to wear that hat. I wonder real quickly how many of our listeners have DevOps as a role in their Scrum team. Can I do just a quick poll, just a yes or a no? While you banter about that, I just wonder how many people have it. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, like I said, there's a trend to move to this world, but I, I would imagine that most people still don't track their stories, uh, you know, DevOps work stories directly in their ticketing system uh, on their Kanban board or their Scrum board, whatever they're using. Mm -hmm. um, that's my instinct, but I, I don't, I don't know. So uh, this sort of indicates probably what I'm thinking is true. Uh, most, most are not, you know, truly integrating them into the team as part of part of the flow. Yeah, we have 75% of our listeners do not have DevOps as a role. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that that doesn't surprise me. Um, but we have found great value out of that, especially with the cloud. Makun, you had mentioned the costing. I mean, you always have to be, uh, cloud isn't a magical cost-free thing, as we all know. So uh, someone has to be focused on that and making sure that we're making good architectural decisions that that keep the costs in check, you know. But that's a whole topic on its own that I don't want to <laughs> dive too deep into. So Makun, uh, in your opinion, I mean, you've seen a lot of, um, a lot of the good and a lot of the bad, maybe a little bit of ugly. Um, what do you think the key roles are? Um, or maybe a better question to ask is, you know, everyone has Dev and Q, asked for Dev and QA and oftentimes product owner. Um, but what do you think is critical for success? Is there one role that if you're missing, you, the whole thing kind of blows up in your mind? Outside of Dev and QA. Oh. Yeah, I think the product owner is responsible for success of the project, right? So it's up to the product owner to make sure that he has the right mix and uh, making sure the backlog is uh, prioritized and things are delivered to uh, requirement. Uh, so, I mean, apart from being the person to blame, I think the product owner is a key role. A uh, lot of develop teams these days don't believe in QA. Uh, they say that, you know, uh, we deploy continuously, we deliver, uh, you know, we go ahead of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the developers uh, write well-tested code, so we don't really need a QA, we are a startup. Uh, that kind of an argument I see a lot from some startups these days. But in my personal opinion, um, the happy path is pretty much what the developer really focuses on. And there are so many obscure uh, scenarios uh, that the mindset of a QA is totally different. And uh, I think that, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, is uh, being lost in translation these days. Uh, developers don't write code and then think of how can I go and break my own flow. Uh, so that's something which I think uh, QA is a critical part of it. But uh, I think that is a bit big, big and bit of a challenge. Uh, all roles uh, are pretty interesting and they help in success in different ways. Uh, the, the problem of not having a role, uh, even something as obscure as a user experience, for example, that can be the uh, differentiator between success and failure. So I think uh, in general, you know, there are risks associated with not having specific roles in uh, the team. And I think uh, addition has to be made of what risk is, you know, uh, which risk can be taken on and which should be mitigated. I, do I don't see one role as being the superb one. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I do have a question from somebody in the audience. Um, Sabu, I'm going to unmute you. If you want to go ahead and ask your question, everybody will be able to hear you. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, so my question was basically, um, 
the devops role uh, is it continuously needed forever assuming that the build and test and the release processes are well hashed out in a team and the team is in a stable state in churning out features and defect fixes over time um do you still need a devops role part time or full time on the team i would think that uh, yeah let me take that and make it pick it up uh, so i would yeah. say that uh, at least at the start uh, you need a full time person until you go into production and you make sure things are running stable and uh, secondly if you're doing a business to b to c uh, and then you anticipate uh, changes in load and what not then you really need to have uh that bandwidth in your team to make sure that you are able to handle the uh, fluctuations in uh, production uh in b2b uh, less so um, at at some point of time you can bring that down to a partial uh, uh requir- requirement uh but that role is critical irrespective of where you are in the product life cycle even if you are in the maintenance phase yeah uh, security is a big topic and uh, somebody needs to wear that hat it's not always the chief security officer who's going to dictate uh, terms for the organization uh, somebody in the team needs to be wearing that hat too so yeah i mean that's that's actually one of the things that we haven't hit on yet but these roles will be taken up by somebody right um when production comes and you need to scale the system a developer at a minimum will probably have to go and figure out how to do that um and so you're certainly better off if you can or to put on your team someone that's focused on that so that you don't distract the developer from actually writing more code and producing more business value right so um so the you know one of the risks of not having a role is that you you um put force that upon someone else who may have a different job right and if you if you get a small enough team they might have 3 4 5 different roles that they're playing and it'd be very difficult to context switch and be successful in all those areas so um So the my answer is uh, someone will be doing it and you have to decide as an organization whether you know it's worth the risk of pulling away you know a developer in this case to manage that uh, or you know you want to invest to you know keep the balance Another question that just came in I'm having a hard time unmuting uh this person but they asked in in your y'all's experience uh what roles do you find that are most commonly missed and what would be the risks of those roles being missed yeah yeah that's similar to the question we asked but uh, different because it's saying what do, what do we see out there right yes yeah, yeah. yeah. macoon um the the subtle difference there is you know when you are working with um engagements and on projects you find a particular role is commonly missed like overlooked or thought not as important uh i don't think there is one specific role uh devops being new i mean a lot of people don't think about it as a separate role uh but then it really depends on the uh, the team uh, composition uh, before they engage with you or when you form the team who are the core members of the team already so when a core team is formed uh most of the times you know all the critical components are there but if a few roles are missing then i have seen that changes from uh, uh project to project uh, it all depends on uh, what's the core team that is put together i haven't we seen one talking, particular role taking the hit when we were talking yesterday or a couple days ago just the three of us we had talked about the role of the scrum master and you said a lot of times there isn't a dedicated scrum master because everybody says oh we can just do it ourselves do you find that projects go awry if there's not a dedicated scrum master I think a scrum so a scrum master is somebody like IT support in my opinion I mean that's a bad analogy but you know when things work uh, nobody notices that role uh, but the, you know a scrum master is really the person who's holding the fort uh, at the end of the day making sure that your uh, agile uh, you know routines are followed making sure that things are on track and uh, uh, the discipline is there uh, I think that role uh, is inherent to teams uh, I have seen some teams where people share it Uh, on a rotational basis because one person doesn't want to play that role on a uh, every, every day right uh, but that role is always there in teams in my opinion even if you don't de- even if you don't declare somebody to be a scrum master i find that people naturally take that up because it generally is chaos otherwise yeah i have i have 
a similar thought there where um, really if you want to mature as an organization, if you want your agile practices to get better, the scrum master is a great person to, to drive and uh, drive that uh, improvement process, right? Drive the retrospectives, make sure action items are uh, being followed up on related to process improvement. Because uh, without that, I mean, that does fall, the dev manager can take on that responsibility, but um, there's, you know, having someone that's just fully responsible for that is very helpful. Making sure people are uh, following all the agreements they've already made, like updating tickets regularly or you know, moving cards appropriately from, you know, lane to lane. Uh, and, you know, running the meetings effectively. Uh, so these are all things that Scrum Masters help that are subtle, but uh, definitely improve your overall capabilities if you have that role. Uh, Sabu in our audience does have another question. Uh, Sabu, you're unmuted. You want to give a call out? Sure. So uh, how do you handle constant interruptions from customer success or support teams uh, for a product development scrum team? Like uh, um, to support the product in production, there's an issue that comes up, uh, that came up, that need to be handled. So how do you handle uh, such constant interruptions uh, in a scrum team? And in such a case, how do you m motivate the team uh, that uh, they have to achieve the sprint goals? that they had uh, signed up for. Thank you. Yeah, uh, interesting question there, Subu. Um, so I think I think this is team by team specific, um, but but my general feeling about this question, Makun, you please expand on this, um, is that that has to flow through like the product owner and it has to be prioritized like anything else. Now, of course it could go to urgent must do next priority, uh, but that that should be you know just part of the flow. It should be built into your process of how you're going to address these types of tickets. Um, as far as motivation, I mean, there's a lot written on that. Um, I think you know rewarding successful outcomes is always a good thing. Um, I just got a new puppy, and that's what we're being taught to do to train our puppies. So I think that also works really well on humans. Not to simplify the problem, but I think you know if you have one of these production issues and you solve it and you get good feedback that you did it quickly and effectively and the customer's happy. I mean, in my experience from the fact being a developer, that always made me feel good. So I think just building on those positive experiences and really emphasizing them is very helpful. Makun, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, some projects, uh, products which we built, uh, there is always this technical depth which is there in the backlog. And uh, sometimes what I have seen happen is that those don't get addressed uh, because the value which is uh, achieved by building a new feature is more shiny than uh, a technical depth that isn't custom impacting at uh, some point in time. And at, after a certain point of time, the technical depth is so large uh, that, you know, when things break, uh, it becomes a you know, it becomes a periodic event, right? Uh, you fix this and then next week something else goes wrong. Uh, you know, your database uh, has a major issue or things like that. So one of the things which we have found works well is uh, you work with the uh, uh, client and make sure that uh, or the product owner tell them that, you know, hey, allocate some bandwidth for technical debt on an ongoing basis uh, so that we can stabilize the product a little better. And uh, that, that way, when interruptions happen, obviously, uh, SLAs have to be met, so interruptions, interruptions will happen. Uh, they, they will get addressed and uh, if the sprint uh, uh, deliver, you know, if two stories have to move out of the sprint because you took on some technical uh, debt to be fixed, uh, your schedule is going to get hit. I mean, uh, but on the other hand, I don't think uh, yeah, nobody, people are going to stop trying to fix production issues, right? But yeah, I mean, prioritizing the backlog, I think it really falls on the product owner. You need to, you know, sneak in a few technical debt items as part of feature. So in a, in a sprint, maybe a couple of stories out of 10 could be for fixing stuff. Uh, that helps. Yeah, that's a good point, Makunda. Um, I think another motivator is when there are problems with technical debt that are really frustrating the team, being able to, to eliminate some of that, you know, even if it's a small win, you know, get that into the backlog, solve some problems so that they feel like their, their needs are being met in terms of, uh, you know, that frustration. 
I do have another question from an audience member. Um, Pankaj, do you, I just unmuted you. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, thanks, Mike and Mukun for sharing your agile checklist. So the question I have in this scrum team in this context, development and QA, you guys talked about DevOps. Can you talk a little bit about development manager as it listed here? What, what role does that play? Is that a must role or what do you see? Uh, projects you do, Mukund, I'll ask you. I think that's more referring to the product manager. Uh, I suppose, uh, I mean, for to avoid confusion with the product owner, I think we use the term development manager, but that mostly uh, is the product manager who's going to make sure that the uh, uh, focus is there on uh, delivering the product uh, to the uh, to the market. Uh, so that depends on the go-to-market strategy, making sure that the monetization plans are in place, uh, making sure that uh, the relief schedules are in place and all that. So that's what we mean by the product manager slash development manager at that point of time. Uh, there is a owner, then there's a product manager who helps the owner with taking that vision to the market. And then you have a product owner who uh, owns the backlog and make sure things are prioritized and things actually get delivered as per the requirements. So this uh, the role is, uh, is on the top there next to the, uh, you know, the business owner. Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of thoughts about uh, dev managers um, and product managers. Um, I, I've been a dev manager for a long time and I coached dev managers as a, you know, the next level up director and VP of engineering. And the role actually ends up being sort of a catch all for anything that's being missed. So, um, but, but also the job is to motivate the people, make sure that they're, you know, playing in the right role and, uh, their success is being met, removing roadblocks, things like that. Now the scrum master many times can take on some of this. And a lot of times in a small team, the dev master or the dev manager and the scrum master are the same person, right? Like those roles get put together, together very naturally. Um, but I, I would think the dev manager's role here is to make sure that everything is working, right? Like that the, the pieces are all coming together, that the constituent teams like you know, product management or, you know, teams that are outside of the realm of this team are also getting their inputs and making key decisions to uh, move the, the ball forward. Because not everything can be decided within this sprint team, right? You have to, uh, there's lots of interactions in the outside world that have to be focused back in. And a dev manager, um, differently than a scrum master, can really focus on helping in that area. While we're still talking about um, the roles, I have another audience member, Brooke, who has a question on the same topic. Brooke, I've unmuted you. Do you want to ask your question? Brooke, are you still there? She had like, when speaking about, you know, adding release managers and our change management practitioners um, to an agile team, are those resources pulled in ad hoc? So, um, so you're talking about release managers and what was the other role? Uh, management um, practitioners. Okay. Yeah. So some processes um, have sort of an umbrella on top of like, if you, especially if you're in a bigger organization, might have an umbrella of uh, roles outside of the actual sprint team that are helping uh, produce the product, right? Getting the product out the door, right? So a release manager's job is really to take what is considered finished product and make sure it actually has everything it needs to become something that can be uh, done in the real world. Uh, my experience with release managers has primarily, like I say, been in large organizations where you have to pull together, you know, documentation teams and mark, maybe marketing and other types of teams to, uh, you know, to get more than just the code out the door, you're getting a whole product uh, out the door, you know, maybe go to market type concerns and such like that. So uh, I think they play outside of this, but again, when I was talking about the, the world that we have to interact with inside of these teams, that would be one of those um, interactions is you know working with the release manager to figure out what their objectives are how we can help them meet them etc cetera, etc cetera. so that would be more of uh, the dev manager taking on the licensing between uh 
you know all the different uh, wings of the organization to make sure that uh, things are delivered as per standard yeah right? and the product manager probably plays a role there too because a lot of a lot of what a, a release manager needs outside of the code comes from you know product definition and um, you know how do we communicate this to the market and things like that uh, so the product manager and the dev role the dev manager definitely play a role there and going back to i guess people are starting to download the checklist and are really looking at it um, a couple people have asked you know if they're trying to convince all the engineering stakeholders to adopt an agile process can this checklist help and how can it help do you want me to take that McCund? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. um yeah so so i think one of the things that this has done for us internally is we sh it's shining the light on the problems that are already kind of well known and it gives us a way to say look if we were to do these things like adopt this practice and have this role in place we can actually eliminate this problem that we all know exists right so it's kind of a roadmap to success in a way um so that's that's where that's how i would use it and that's definitely how we've used it within centers and i've seen great success there yeah, most of our clients uh, are able to identify, you know, they're able to correlate with the risk. You know, if their team is suffering from a symptom, then they're able to see, yeah, I have this problem, a very different variation of the problem. And then they're able to see, oh, so you're telling me that, you know, this person might be able to mitigate this. Then then the conversation starts on, you know, how does that happen? So uh, if you take that to any team, I think... Uh, just validating the processes that they follow uh, at any point of time is good. Agile is all about low process, but on the other hand, you know, there is some level of uh, discipline and ownership which needs to be there. Uh, and that helps. It helps yeah, to make sure that you're doing it. Can you apply this checklist to a team that's not agile? Well, you can. Yeah, that was actually what I was about ready to talk about is um, if you if you look at any team and you apply the checklist, um, it's going to apply at some level, right? Um, and like I say, if you review that team, you might find um, you know this, these are our risks. And if you have to be um, a non-agile or you have certain restrictions that force you to have certain you know waterfall-like processes, like maybe you're manufacturing medical equipment or something like that. And the, the test rigor has to be much higher than, uh, you know, if you're making a mobile app for, um, you know, for e-commerce or something. Um, There's certain parts of e-commerce apps that are really critical, like the actual payment part, but like a lot of it, if it didn't work just right, you know, it's not a big deal, but in medical, you don't want it to maybe work correctly. So in those environments, and we've actually dealt with a client um, with that type of restriction, we applied the checklist so that we could find the risks and then we use those risks and mitigated them. We mitigation strategy against each risk to say, okay, well, we have this, this thing that's potentially gonna be a problem for us. Like maybe it's predictability of delivery or something like that. We, um, we put mitigations around that. So we make sure that we didn't get exposed by that risk. So I do think it's useful, um, especially if you're planning on adopting agile. Uh, it can be very useful to say, oh, where where should we focus, right? Instead of taking like a big leap forward, maybe you can take baby steps by understanding which risks you want to knock off first. Excellent. That's all the questions that I'm getting from the audience. Do you guys have anything else to wrap this up? Uh, well, Makun, I just have one last question. Um, from my seat, sure. I feel like um, this checklist is really helping us, our organization, move the ball forward and get better. Uh, how do you feel? Do you feel the same? Yes. So when uh, see, uh, it helps in a couple of ways, right? Uh, obviously, it helps the uh, team better, better, but it also helps. Uh, management uh, look at uh, risk areas uh, on a at, a at a collective level to see you know where more attention needs to be given and we did our internal analysis on different products that we built for different customers uh, whatnot and we found that when certain roles are missing which we consider are you know critical we found that uh, by doing 
uh, uh, analysis of what happened in the last couple of years when we bought this checklist app we found that yes you know when we say this thing should go wrong yes it went wrong in that project so uh, you know there is some validation for uh, the the, the uh, risks which we have which are documented here and uh, it has helped uh, have a conversation with the customers to you know kind of explain to them you know why uh, things are happening the way they are happening and how things can be done better uh, so it's re- it's helpful yeah so i think i think uh, those of you out there that are listening could use this also to talk to your constituents now, maybe you don't have you know customers as uh, Makun was talking about it but you could go to your constituents and say hey i went through this checklist and i think here's our weaknesses and you know maybe we should shore these things up so i do think it could be effective for any organization yeah. excellent well thank you i know you both have offered to answer questions after after this is over um let me just share your contact info there you go there's mike and how mike's email and mccun's email address um i'll also send this out to everybody in an email um but thank you both very much this zip chat is supposed to be just a quick little 30 40 minute conversation between subject matter experts and interactive with our audience. And I think we have achieved that today. So thank you very much. And Makun, thank you for staying up so late. I know it's a little late there in India, but I really appreciate it. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Mike, and thanks, Makun. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Thank you, Jim. Nice talking to you, Makun. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.